bow your heads and pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our faithful God, Heavenly Father, and our victorious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text today comes from Psalm 100, verses 4 through 5. This is the theme verse for our tournament this weekend, and I expanded it out to the pri verse prior to that. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I could put it exactly into words what a blessing and an honor this is for me to be standing here right now. Now, I probably have to put that into context for you. Uh, as Pastor said, I am a son of the congregation. Uh, about When I was about four years old, my father took a, accepted a call to be a teacher here at Trinity. And so from about the time I was four years old, all the way to the time I was in, uh, or all the time until I graduated from Trinity, um, we lived in Cedar Rapids. And so growing up over those 10 years, um, holiday season lasted for three holidays. We started with Thanksgiving, personally one of my favorites. I mean, football, food, family, how can you beat that, right? And of course, as a kid growing up, everyone's excited for Christmas. Get gifts and yeah, Jesus is born too. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and then the holiday season did not conclude for me at least until this weekend. <laughs> See, you have to understand the reason why I am a, uh, a self described sports nut is most likely because of this weekend. I mean, you can almost imagine it as a young person. You walk into school on a Monday even before the tournament starts, and already there's an air of excitement. Dress-up days. I get to wear whatever clothes I want. I get to dress crazy. There's decorations all over the school hallways. In the, in the gym, I remember this so distinctly. It's one of my favorite things. I'm not saying I'm disappointed this year, Cooler, but there used to be a time where they would post the mascots of every single team up on the gym wall. Almost as if to say, this weekend, this is the home of the Trojans, but this is your home too. What a neat experience. I can remember the colors of parents and students and fans from all over the Midwest. The reds and the golds, the greens and the whites, the blues and the golds. Am I right, boys? Yeah, there you go. All right. And that buzz, it was just electrifying, almost intoxicating as a child. In fact, to the point where, you know, I would beg my parents, can please, 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 can we stay? Can we stay just one more game? And you can imagine how grateful they were that we lived just across the soccer field. So by the time I was in first or second grade, and yes, this was a different time, I could trudge myself through the snow and go and find my spot on that stage in the student section, and from the opening tip until the award ceremony on Sunday, you would find little Chad at the edge of that stage high-fiving every single starter from every single school the entire weekend. And as I sat there and I would high five those big kids, and I would in my head start to think about what it's going to be like when it was my time, my turn, and we were going to hoist that trophy. Maybe for some of you, that's what this weekend is about. It's that moment where it's your time, it's your moment, your opportunity. And then when I finally got there, seventh, eighth grade year, and I just remember running out of the door and going into warm-ups and just that feeling of, this is my floor. This is my game. 
Everyone's here to watch us. What an electrifying feeling. There was nothing better at that time in my life. So you can imagine how important this weekend is to me. Add on to that the fact that while this might be a uh, fairly, uh, this might be an exclusive club, I may be the only one who can claim to have played for the whole school, played a tournament for a visiting school, as well as having coached in the tournament at some point. And now I, here I am talking to you. So I'm pretty sure there's not many people can say that they've hit that, you know, trifecta or even that uh, four-peat. So to say that this weekend is important to me personally would be a gross understatement. And that's why I love the verse that we chose for this weekend. I want to read for you the entire song because I think it bears reading because of the context that it gives us. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Now, if I were to look at that verse as a student, or at my, at my time here, I may have looked at that verse and thought, yeah, shout for joy. Yeah, we get to go out and high-five the big kids. Yeah, we get to wear our school colors. Yeah, we get to surround ourselves with basketball. That's why this weekend is so important. <laughs> but as many of you know, who have been here for, uh, during my time as a, a child here, things change. You start to look like a father a little bit more, and people remind you of that constantly. Um, but you start to take a little bit different perspective. And as I reminisced about this weekend, I started to realize that there were different stories and memories that really stood out. Different stories and memories that told what a unique blessing a weekend like this can be. I can imagine, I can remember a mother in the bleachers being tended to by parents from various different schools because she had fallen and twisted her ankle badly. I can remember gathering together on Saturday nights at the end of the, at the conclusion of games and members from Trinity opening up their homes to students from out of state so they would have a place to stay. I can remember distinctly the devotions at the beginning of every single game where the word of God would be clearly shared with every single athlete, coach, official, and fan. I remember the themes based directly off of scripture, adorning banners and t-shirts and programs. See, there's something unique about this tournament. There's something unique about this experience that you're not going to find many other places. That uniqueness is that we have all these blessings for so many years, and we almost can't help but do what the psalmist says. Shout for joy. Give thanks. Give thanks and praise to God because of this basketball tournament. Now this is the point of the message where I go into coach mode. I'm going to call a timeout. Because if you're paying close attention, which I know sometimes is a struggle, did you hear what I just said? Give thanks and praise. Rejoice for this basketball tournament. See, certainly
certainly this is a time for celebration. Certainly this is a time where we should rejoice. We should shout for joy. No one is denying that. But the minute that this celebration becomes about basketball or trophies, we've lost the point. Satan's gained a foothold. Because if we're really honest with ourselves, as wonderful as this weekend is, how can we expect a basketball tournament to cause a student who is dealing with struggles at home to enter his gates with thanksgiving? How can we expect a basketball tournament to cause a parent who's recently lost their job to drive to another state to participate in this event? How are they going to enter his courts with praise? Because you see, that's when the reality of things starts to rear its ugly head. The reality is if we put our hope in the things of this world, even amazing events like a basketball tournament, we see the ugliness of our own sinful nature. And when we put our hope in those things of this world, we find out that the world is hopeless, empty, and condemned. It's not a pretty picture. I can almost distinctly remember there was a time, I think the time is starting to fade, there was a time where if you went to a Trinity Trojan basketball game, you knew what the score was without even looking at the scoreboard, depending on what state of disheveledness Coach Mueller was in. <laughs> Losing the tie, probably down by 10. Losing the coat, if he still has the coat on, we're in good shape. I might even get into play. So, I'm just kidding. And as we consider that, that's where we're at with the world. We're in that state of disheveledness. And if we look closely at the last 50 years of basketball tournaments, We'd be naive not to say that there are going to be moments of technical fouls, instances of poor sportsmanship, moments of vanity or arrogance. And we can think of any number of sinful stains that are going to mar the last 50 years. And at risk of overdoing the basketball analogy, Satan's putting on the full court press. Paul realized it. In Corinthians, he says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, and not destroyed. Hard-pressed? Perplexed? Persecuted? If we are honest with ourselves, defeat looks imminent. All the odds are stacked against us and we can't seem to get out of our own way. We know what the ultimate result of that sin is. It's separation from God eternally. Enter his gates with thanksgiving? Are you kidding me? This isn't turning into a victory parade all of a sudden. It's a death march. But that's when God in his goodness, in his love, and his faithfulness completely turns the tables. We heard it in the song. Let's look at that. If you, if you would, please look in your um, bulletin. We read it responsibly. For every instance where we're told to shout for joy, where we're told to worship the Lord, where we're told to enter with thanksgiving and with praise and give thanks, for every instance, instance where that comes up, look at what it says about our God. Why are we able to do those things? How are we able to do those things? We're able to do those because the Lord is God. We're able to do those things because it is He who made us. We are His. We are His people, the sheep of this pasture. We're able to do those things. 
things because the Lord is good. And his love endures forever. See, as we look at those things, what the psalmist is reminding is that we know how we're going to overcome those things. We know where the victory is. By his grace and his mercy, he sent his son to take on human flesh like you and me. He lived a perfect life that we could not achieve. He took on our sin as the atoning sacrifice so that by his blood, no longer are we going to be crushed. No longer are we going to be in despair. No longer are we destroyed. But instead, we are restored. We are renewed. We are redeemed. I love what Paul says. It's almost as if he's leading a cheer. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? You see, the last 50 years is not about basketball tournaments. It's not about coaches. It's not about even the concession stands. It's about for 50 years. And beyond even that, and well into the future, that God in his faithfulness has brought us to the waters of baptism and called us his own and washed over us and restored us. And he said, you are mine. It's that in 50 years, and for 50 years before that, and 50 years beyond that, he's called us to his altar and said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of my faithfulness to you and the forgiveness that comes freely by my son, Jesus Christ. And he takes that idea and by bringing us to the waters of baptism and bringing us to the altar, he brings us to the foot of the cross as defeated sinners and he says, I am faithful. You are mine. You are forgiven. And he brings us to the opening of that empty tomb. At which point, what else can you do but celebrate the victory? One of my favorite reminders is on the front of your bulletin. This is called the Conqueror's Cross. Throughout the history of the church, this symbol has been seen. And as we initially look at it, we go, okay, a bunch of letters, not sure what they mean, and okay, there's the cross. The number of the letters at the top are the first and last letters of the Greek words for Jesus Christ. But it's the letters that are at the bottom that remind us what God's faithfulness is all about. You see, at the bottom of that letter, or at the bottom of that cross, are the letters N-I-K-A. In Greek, that's the term Nika. Now, many of you young people probably know, look at that and go, oh, is this like Phil Knight, uh, Nike, uh, just do it, right? There's a reason why they use that term to sell their shoe brand. Because they want you to be victorious. They want you to conquer whatever it is that you're participating in. And when we look at this cross, and we look at that word, Nika, victory, Christ has conquered. See, whatever happens today, there's going to be a 50th champion put in the program for next year. And there's also going to be numerous other athletes and teams that are not going to have that honor. 
But every single person in this room will walk out of this sanctuary, Nika, victory, conquerors. We walk out of here as conquerors because of what Christ has done. You see, for the last 50 years, Trinity has not hosted an event. No, Trinity has hosted a ministry. And that ministry is that for the last 50 years, on one weekend, every January, students, parents, family, friends from all over the Midwest have gathered together, not because of a basketball, but because of a cross, because of the victory that we all share in. They come to hear the precious word of God. The precious word of God. Nika. Victory. I was in fifth or sixth grade. A school that we were at, had at the tournament um, for many years had tragically lost a teacher uh, and one of their scorekeepers just a few months prior to the tournament. And before the last game that that school played in the tournament that year, there was a, a short presentation. And Trinity presented the school with a um, emblem, similar to what you see posted up in the walls of the gym now. And it had that school's emblem on it. And it was given to them in honor of that teacher that had passed away. But there's something about that moment that stuck with me and perfectly exemplifies what today is all about. During the course of that presentation, a Bible verse was read from John 11, 25. I am the resurrection and the life. Nika, victory. That's what this weekend is about. And now you are called as Trinity Trojans, or Emmanuel Eagles, or Emmanuel Lancers, or wherever you come from. You are called to go back to your homes, and your schools, and your places of work. And you are called to share with each and every person that you come in contact with, not just during basketball tournaments, but each and every day, to live in the victory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, we celebrate his faithfulness for the victory through all generations. And certainly he has used this tournament as an opportunity to demonstrate that faithfulness. May God in his faithfulness continue to use each one of us, this congregation, this tournament, and all of us, as is his will, to share the message of victory until Christ returns. And then we can truly enter his courts with praise as his redeemed children. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds until life eternal.